Good morning, sabah al khair, salam alaikum. Um, it's indeed a great pleasure and honor uh, to be invited by uh, the Middle East Institute in uh, SOAS and the University of London um, to talk to you today. And um, as uh, uh, Dr. Hassan mentioned, when um, he sent an invitation, I thought this is a golden opportunity uh, to talk to you about the recent publication that the United Nations Environment Program has just uh, published. And it talks about environmental challenges, the policies and, and uh, mega trends that are taking place in the region and uh, what can we do to address them. Um, of course, I mean, uh, first of all, congratulations for the 100 years birthday. Uh, SOAS is well known to everybody in the region. I have many colleagues working with me in the UN system who have worked with SOAS. And of course, um, this is going to be probably the first step towards a more coordinated, uh, fruitful partnership uh, between the UN environment and SOAS and the Middle East in Institute. Um, it is indeed uh, very important to rely on uh, scientists, uh, scholars, and uh, people who do know the region very well. And probably sometimes looking at the region from an outside perspective, we do need to have that uh, non-biased scientific uh, research. Um, as you probably know, the UN environment, we call ourselves a science-based organization. And one of our main divisions is the science division. It is used to, to be called the uh, division of technology, industry, and economy. Uh, but most recently, we have renamed it to be the science division. And most of our work is science-based, because if you want to make an argument with politicians, with uh, uh, policy makers, and so on, it has to be science-based. Um, so partnering with uh, centers of excellence, with institutions, is very important uh, for all of us. Um, I am also honored that uh, I am making this presentation only for the second time. The first time was when we launched the publication in Nairobi, in Kenya, uh, during the United Nations Environment Assembly, which is a you, you may call it the Parliament of Environment Ministers, where 193 ministers meet every other year to discuss uh, global environmental issues, regional environmental issues, and adopt decisions that uh, become bound, uh, bound for countries to abide to and implement. Um, so the first launch was in May of uh, this year during the uh, assembly, and this is the second launch, and I'm very honored and pleased to, to do so. And the next, the very next step will be presenting the document to the Council of Arab Ministers responsible for the environment, which is taking place in Cairo uh, early December. Um, and I, I am the secretary of uh, that council, uh, we provide support for uh, the ministers for the dialogue. We bring up important environmental issues where uh, we all discuss and uh, present policy options for policymakers to uh, adopt and, of course, um, back uh, implement uh, their decisions and support them in policy and in, in capacity building and sometimes implementation uh, of our programs. Uh, yes, oh, the day before yesterday I was on TV, uh, I don't know if you know uh, the famous Arab singer Raghib Alama, uh, he's our goodwill ambassador and he was on a uh, show and he invited me to speak and one of the questions from the audience was, we don't see the UN on the ground helping us tackle our problems. Uh, so my, my answer was simply, uh, the UN is not supposed to do things for people. We are supposed to build the capacity of the people for them to do, the, uh, to do it themselves. So we work on policies. We work on 
uh, finding the root causes of issues. Um, why are we not advancing in water management, for example? What can we do at the policy level so we can tackle the issues and problems um, from the, the, the root of it? So, uh, you know, we prevent them from happening again. Because if you beautify a thing, it is just, you know, a cosmetic solution. But uh, we have to work on uh, really the root causes of it. So, um, as I said, we launched it in uh, UNIA, United Nations Environment Assembly, and this is uh, the sixth of the uh, series, which we call the Global Environment Outlook. Um, we publish regional reports for our six regions, and you know, the division is just arbitrary, West Asia or Asia Pacific or Africa and, and what have you. Uh, but we try to cover, of course, uh, the entire globe. Um, so West Asia is one of the six uh, regions. Uh, the GEO6 uh, global report is expected to be launched in 2018 in the fourth session of the United Nations Environment Assembly. It was supposed to be uh, next year, but it was delayed because of we changed the uh, uh, timing of the assembly. Um, it is, as I mentioned, based on science. Uh, it is being put uh, by uh, scholars, government representatives, NGOs, stakeholders participating in the process. It's a huge process that spans over two years of work where we uh, uh, convene the all stakeholders um, responsible for the different uh, aspects of environment and we discuss priorities. Um, the priority setting um, uh, workshop was held in Amman, uh, 2015, where we went through all environmental issues and identified the most important priorities for the region. And then uh, there was another process to identify the trends of, of emerging issues, because we have to keep an eye. The UN environment is the uh, highest environmental authority that is uh, responsible for keeping the environment under review. So it is our uh, duties to predict what's gonna happen in the near future or uh, in the future in general and uh, alert policymakers and uh, all those who are concerned to work on them. Um, it was uh, really, I mean, in the heart of our uh, conference uh, today on conflicts, it was uh, amazing that also the scholars from the region uh, identified uh, peace and security as a cross-cutting priority uh, for the region. Um, talking about occupation in Palestine, it is impeding any uh, efforts for sustainable development. Uh, we have been working with donors trying to uh, solicit uh, support to build for example, solar systems for energy uh, generation, uh, water desalination plants, and all donors said, well, for God's sake, I mean, if we give you billions of dollars and, and the second day Israel comes and bombs those facilities, so where is the sustainability of our uh, investment? So, uh, indeed, uh, peace and security is a major issue. Um, of course, you can name maybe you can name all the countries and you would find uh, an element of conflict in each and every country in the region. Um, so uh, the report, um, which I have a copy here and I will be happy to leave uh, a number of copies um, with SOAS. Um, it's an outlook and we uh, always like to call it an outlook because it doesn't only mention problems, but also uh, talks about policy options and what is needed by governments and stakeholders to uh, take the lead in, in uh, trying to uh, tackle these issues. So what are the issues that have been identified by uh, the group of uh, eminent uh, participants or lead writers? Uh, obviously, water resources. Uh, shared water resources, 80% uh, 
uh, of our water resources in the West Asia region comes from outside the region. Air quality has been identified as one major issue. Unsustainable consumption and production, more into consumption rather than production. The region is more uh, importing than exporting. Biodiversity challenges and waste generation and management. So as I mentioned, uh, peace and security is a cross-cutting issue. Uh, the war in Syria, um, we've been talking yesterday and today of the root causes for the conflict and some scholars, some even UN organizations are trying to connect uh, the crisis to environmental issues. And there are some, um, well, I, I cannot say scientifically proven yet uh, facts that uh, the drought in the uh, northeastern part of the country uh, over the past 15 years led to the migration of agriculture and uh, farmers from that part into the cities and mainly to Damascus, creating uh, pressures on the resources of the capital and other cities. So people argue that this is one of uh, the causes for uh, the, uh, um, the issues uh, taking place now in, in Syria. Of course, the refugee crisis, um, the migration of uh, millions of people within Syria. There are 8 million people displaced within the country, uh, and there are more than 2.6 million people who have uh, chosen to uh, flee the country and go to Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan mainly, and other countries. Um, you know, for Jordan, receiving 20% more into its population is a major challenge. For Lebanon to receive 25% more into the population is a challenge on their natural resources, water resources, energy that does not really exist in, in Lebanon, uh, and of course the generation of waste and, and what have you. Um, the, the problem in uh, the migration is that in Jordan, uh, uh, the, the issue is confined. Uh, people, or the, the government, because um, it's used to do so with uh, a number of crises ha happening, um, uh, Syrians are sent to uh, some refugee camps. So most of the refugees go to uh, managed places. In Lebanon, the problem is bigger uh, because they don't have camps. They do not allow uh, establishment uh, of, of camps. And even the, uh, if there is a small camp that is established, it is illegal and they close an eye, but uh, they integrate into the villages and the villages of Lebanon are already suffering uh, poverty and, and social uh, issues. Um, so adding to the problems uh, within uh, the country. Water, uh, probably I cannot uh, say enough about water uh, challenges in the region. Eight uh, out of 10 the most scarce countries in the world are in the Arab states region. Um, and of course, scarcity of water is measured by uh, the accessibility and the uh, uh, how much they, they, get, they get water in, in addition to the stress on, uh, on the water resources. So eight out of 10 global scarce countries are in our region. Um, more than 75 to 80 percent of our water resources comes from outside the region. Um, so the issue of management of shared water resources. Um, countries are, uh, what are, are they doing? They are over-exploiting their water resources. Um, in Jordan, they have reached 90% uh, over-utilization of their water resources. Uh, in, in Palestine, um, all the aquifers, aquifers, according to the UNEP 2006 report, is unreplenishable. I mean, the, the, it, you cannot do anything with the groundwater resources. It's already desalinized. It is already polluted by uh, the wastewater uh, going into the groundwater and so on. So uh, the issue is really 
of, of uh, imminent and um, uh, high uh, level of uh, seriousness. Um, regional cooperation almost does not exist uh, on shared water resources. Yes, there might be some international conferences on the Nile Basin, on the Jordan River Basin, on the Euphrates and Tigris and, and so on. But there are no agreed agreements uh, or uh, you know, conventions for management of sh shared water resources. I personally worked with the University of Harvard in 1994, actually, when uh, we signed the peace process with Israel, uh, trying to establish a water management authority, a regional water management authority, uh, but of course, because uh, Syria doesn't talk to Israel, there's no agreement, and of course you cannot uh, establish a, a shared water authority between two countries while there are two other countries involved in the uh, same uh, water resource uh, being Syria and Lebanon. Uh, so it was only uh, you know, a, a, um, a scientific, theoretical work that we have done. Uh, it was never implemented. Um, so the management of water resources, not only between uh, countries at war, but also between neighboring countries. For example, there are aquifers that are shared between Jordan and Saudi Arabia, between Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, uh, Oman and Yemen, uh, Kuwait and Iraq, and, and what have you. I mean, there are a number of those uh, shared water resources. In one of the meetings that I, uh, again, I am also the secretary of the uh, Council of Ministers what, uh, responsible for water resources. Uh, in one of the discussions, I was talking about this specific issue and I was calling for the Arabs to adopt agreements and, and initiate uh, uh, conventions and sign them and, and you know, put, put uh, meat into the uh, bones of, you know, how are we trying to, to manage these water resources? And the minister at that time of Saudi Arabia said, yeah, it doesn't happen this way. Uh, we are all brothers, so if our king uh, meets the king of Jordan and they say, okay, release 100 million cubic meter to Jordan, they will immediately release. So this is the mentality uh, that we have in the region. They don't believe in agreements, signing agreements. Uh, they just believe in being brothers and you know, uh, charity and you know, we give uh, what you need and, and, and so on. But it is important for the future generations. Uh, you cannot always have uh, agreements in, in such a way. Uh, so we do need to establish uh, those international agreements to be able to manage the water resources. Um, Yad? OK. Oh, five minutes. Oh, really? OK. Um, air pollution. Um, one of the uh, issues that are, we are uh, witnessing, and I think there's in a program uh, somebody talking about uh, dust and sandstorms, this is a major issue in the region. It is not an environmental issue only. It is a socioeconomic environmental uh, phenomena uh, that is causing uh, billions of dollars in loss every single year. For example, imagine the uh, Dubai International Airport closing for hours because of a sandstorm. Imagine in Qatar, this is government announcement, they cannot fly their fighter jets to protect their, uh, their country in the event of a sandstorm. So it is a major security, environmental, socioeconomic issue which we are uh, facing in, in the region. Uh, there are numbers talking about 70,000 premature deaths, deaths per year in the West Asia region because of air pollution, and mainly indoor uh, air pollution because of the poverty that exists because of the people uh, using, uh, you know, uh, production of energy using uh, wood and, and other means. Uh, the issues in the region are even compounded and more uh, uh, complex because of the interrelationship between issues. For example, if you talk about water resources, you talk about desalination. If you talk about desalination, you talk about 
energy resources needed to desalinate. And if you talk about energy and production of desalinated water, which is mainly used for agricultural purposes, then you are talking about food security. And then this three-tier uh, nexus is very important. And some others, they actually add a fourth one, which is climate change. Imagine if climate change uh, takes place. I mean, it is taking place, but when the temperature rises, when the uh, salinity of uh, the ocean uh, rises, then what happens to the installations for the production of desalinated water? Um, land degradation is also an important issue, and uh, we have been witnessing that more and more, uh, especially because of urbanization, uh, farmers uh, abandoning their uh, farms and, and using them for building new cities, uh, uh, even uh, dredging and, and uh, building in the ocean, you know, hundreds of new islands are being built in uh, or around the coasts of uh, uh, West Asia region. Waste management, probably you've uh, heard about the crisis in Lebanon, uh, which has started actually in the 70s, but now it's been uh, you know, taking a much more um, uh, size that uh, people are, uh, have, have started suffering uh, health issues. Uh, you know, um, the number of uh, patients going into the hospitals has quadrupled in a few months. And I um, was there uh, just uh, three days ago talking to the, um, the ministers responsible for the uh, uh, portfolio for the file. Unfortunately, because of the failed state in Lebanon, you cannot find a trustworthy entity to talk to. And the major problem uh, for waste management is the lack of trust between the government and between the people. The people doesn't trust the government and the government doesn't trust that the people uh, will support their uh, actions. Um, so we have established a, an integrated waste management program uh, for uh, Lebanon. So, uh, however, we see some uh, positive elements that we can build on. Um, the, of course, you know, the 17 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and they are uh, related to all aspects of environmental issues. Uh, and, and please, um, you know, when we talk about the SDGs, uh, I often hear even uh, some uh, UN colleagues, they say, well, uh, yeah, you are responsible for Goal 6, 7, 13, and, and what have you. No. We are all responsible for all the 17 development goals. If we cannot integrate environmental issues into the 17 development goals, we fail in demonstrating and implementing the essence of the sustainable development goals. The integrated approach is uh, very important. And the integrated approach is something that we are using in this uh, document uh, to call for the policy actions, integrated uh, wa uh, water management, integrated waste management, integrated energy management, and so on. So the integrated approach is very important for all of our uh, uh, work. I wanted to also touch upon, um, as Dr. Hassan is an economist, I, I said I have to say this, uh, economy and environment cannot but work together. Um, economy depends on environmental resources but also environmental resources would require a sustainable green economic development to continue surviving. And probably you know uh, that the UN environment launched the green economy concept. Uh, it was mentioned in uh, the Rio plus 20 declaration 44 times. Now uh, we are talking about inclusive green economy um, and we have launched a very innovative uh, initiative, which is the UNEP Finance Initiative. Uh, we are working with governors of central banks for the use and utilization of investments from an environmental or sustainable uh, development point of view. Uh, we are talking about hundreds of trillions of dollars. If we can green those investments, then we can achieve something not only in the West Asia region, but in all other regions. So what needs uh, to be done for the transformational change? International commitment, of course, data, 
availability in the region is a major challenge. And we had uh, held the Eye on Earth Summit uh, last year in Abu Dhabi, where we talked about the challenges in getting data, uh, analyzing the data, disseminating the data, data and using it for uh, policy uh, making. And of course, uh, all, all over uh, uh, cross-cutting issue is the financial uh, commitments. I would stop here. I mean, there are a couple of slides on how uh, UN environment really tackles environment, environment peace building, and conflicts. Um, mainly, our work used to be a post-crisis assessment. So uh, whenever a crisis ceases, we, we go there, assess the uh, damages, and, and uh, provide uh, projects and programs uh, to tackle them. But, uh, understanding that environmental issues can be the cause for conflict or cause for cooperation. If you have, I mean, in life, you select a partner where, when you have common grounds that you can work with them. Um, between countries, of course, there are shared natural resources that can be, if uh, utilized effectively, can be a source for uh, cooperation rather than uh, conflict. Um, so, what we do is provide impartial and scientific information, uh, ensure that environmental dimension is integrated into uh, the conflict, disaster, and prevention, and uh, build the capacity of member states. Uh, one of the issues that I'm working uh, uh, on with the government of Lebanon, not only providing an integrated uh, strategic plan for waste management, but bringing from the Department of Political Affairs a mediator to be able to talk to the uh, different uh, factions within the, uh, the, the country to uh, try to bring them together. So this is part of peace building and conflict uh, prevention. Um, these are the resources where, uh, you know, uh, conflicts can happen or cooperation as well. Um, this, this is some uh, examples of where we have uh, worked and what are the sources of conflicts. Internal conflicts seem to be uh, the highest uh, source of conflicts uh, in, in the region. Um, Drivers uh, for conflict over natural resources, competition, of course, uh, and equitable access. Uh, we've been talking about uh, you know, people having access to water wells while uh, the poor people do not even have access to uh, safe uh, water and so on. Um, and the, these are the three dimensions that we integrate into peace building and conflict prevention. The, uh, prevention and sensitivity, conflict sensitivity, 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 peace building and uh, state building and mitigating the uh, uh, resource uh, curse. So, uh, thank you, sir. I am done. Thank you. Thank you.